ethics or business? If you do diversity mainly for ethical reasons, put your hands up. Come on, put your hands up. Okay. And if you do diversity mainly for business reasons, put your hands up. Okay. Clearly, this is a central point of disagreement at many companies. And as folks are deciding whether to start diversity practices or deepen them, they often get hung up on this issue. Should we do it for ethics or do it for uh, business reasons? And I'm here today to tell you, do it for ethics. If you do it for that reason, the dividends will follow and they will be greater than anything you anticipated while you were writing the business case. How do I know this? Well, I'm a journalist and I've covered the workplace for 20 years. I started out uh, covering employment discrimination lawsuits, which were coursing through corporate America in the mid-1990s. And if you've ever read any of these cases, they're ugly and startling. And I wondered if these were widespread problems. And so I thought, well, I'll do a study. I'll look at the Fortune 100 and I'll count the number of employment discrimination suits against these companies. Well, I gathered the information and I started counting and counting and counting. And there were so many, I only could make one conclusion and that was that companies are complex places and they have complex problems. And what I needed to do for the next step was to take a different avenue of research. What I found was that uh, I began looking at the Fortune 100 and looking at the diversity of executive officers. Those are responsible for administering policy in the corporation. And I found two companies that were ahead of all the others, and neither one of them started with a business case for diversity. Now, I've put this information together in a book called The Diversity Index, but I'm gonna tell you today the stories of the two CEOs who made it happen. Ray Gil Martin was the CEO of Merck, and he came in as an outsider. He'd been a CEO before, but he had never led Big Pharma. And he was an engineer, and he saw companies as systems. You know, you have to put in top-down mechanisms and bottom-up mechanisms. And as he went on his listening tour of the company, he heard concerns that it wasn't as diverse as it said it was or, or thought it was. And, you know, he thought about his own experience, his own career, growing up uh, in a working class household, being the first to go to college, and then being able to rise, you know, within the companies due to his hard work and ingenuity. And he wanted to bring this to Merck. He wanted to establish a sort of meritocracy where people would be seen and rewarded for the education, talent, and work that they brought. Uh, to the office, and he started talking about this in every meeting, and uh, he established an 800 number where employees could call from anywhere all over the world to report, you know, ethical problems they were having, and it turned out that 90% of the complaints were about employment issues. My manager isn't treating me fairly, and so he realized he had to put more diversity training into effect. And they did their employee ERGs, and they widened their hiring pools, and they reassessed their promotional practices. By 2005, Merck had 79% of its executive officers uh, as females and uh, minority members. That was the highest that has ever been reached in the Fortune 100, and it's never been matched since. Now, Gil Martin would not point to a, a financial dividend for diversity. Merck isn't really like that. Its motto is to put patients before profits. But what he did get was a, 
uh, resilience dividend. In 2004, Vioxx, which was a, um, uh, a drug that Merck produced, a painkiller, was recalled from the market due to adverse effects on patients. The company, it destabilized the company, but what Gilmartin found was that these employees that he had treated fairly, they really threw their weight into riding the ship and they helped keep that company afloat. One of the people that Merck hired, Gilmartin hired, was Ken Frazier, who led the defense of Merck during this period and is now the CEO. So Merck got not only a resilience dividend, but a talent dividend in, in a man who ultimately became its current leader. Now, PepsiCo had the second highest level of diversity, 66% in 2005, under the leadership of Steve Reinemann. Reinemann was an insider. He had been there for 16 years. And he, like Gil Martin, uh, had been able to rise. You know, Reinemann was the son of a single mother who struggled to keep the family afloat. He didn't get a fancy education, but he wanted people to bring their intellectual horsepower to work and to be rewarded for it. And he said this in front of every gathering like this. He also knew from his experience at PepsiCo that in every interaction there was diversity happening from the farmers who planted the seeds to the processors the distributors, the vendors, and the customers. And he felt if you could raise the tone of that interaction, raise the quality, that you would also increase sales. And in 2004, they estimated that 1% of PepsiCo's revenues were due to diversity efforts. Because inside their ERGs, a fermentation was happening. Marketers were talking to food scientists, and together they were coming up with guacamole Doritos and wasabi snacks. And employees at PepsiCo were bringing their full palate to PepsiCo and beyond. Now, both of these companies uh, clearly have benefited from diversity. And now those CEOs are gone, there are new CEOs, but the companies continue to go deeper. And they both have what I call the truth dividend. And that is that they are able to ask those difficult questions of the company which go to the future of their business. At Merck, in the global constituency groups, senior leaders are asking, why would some patients not get their prescriptions fu fulfilled? And why, once they got them filled, would they not take all of the medication? Well, you know, then they began to brainstorm. Well, perhaps people trust home remedies more. Perhaps they're worried about side effects. Uh, now, the senior leaders at Merck, they haven't come up with the final solutions, but when they do, you can be sure that their answers will take them into the future where the company needs to go. At PepsiCo, they're asking the same questions. Why would certain consumers not buy our products? Well, it turns out that a lot of people uh, like healthier food. They don't like a lot of the ingredients PepsiCo is using, and the company is starting to change the ingredients and make healthier products. So in closing today, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to start with the ethical vision. Out of that, the truth will flow, because when you allow people to bring their full selves to work, they're able to ask the riskier questions. They're able to tell the truth. And in that, you will get the greatest dividends. Thank you.